Okay, with that, I'm gonna get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, uh, Kurt Newton. Uh, Kurt leads MIT's Open Courseware project in supporting millions of learners and educators each year with materials from over two and a half thousand MIT courses. He joined Open Courseware in 2004, shortly after its launch, captivated by the promise of open education and worked as the publication manager and then the Open Courseware site curator prior to becoming its director in 2018. Before joining OpenCourseWare, Kurt applied his electrical engineering degrees from Iowa State and Stanford uh, 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 as the optical and data uh, network systems engineer and product manager. Uh, Kurt is also a community leader in climate change, serving as MIT's climate education working group, facilitating workshops uh, with the En-ROADS Climate Simulator, from Nonprofit Climate Interactive and MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative. He helped launch the and collaboratively lead the Boston Green New Deal Coalition Civic Network. The title of this talk is Interim Keynote, 21 Years of Scaling OER. Thank you uh, and hand it off to Kurt. Thanks so much, Nilmar. And uh, it's really an honor to uh, to get to be with you, spend this, spend this hour or so, you know, I think of, uh, What's uh, what's happening in California universities as a uh, you know, you know bellwether part of the leading edge of um, of the development of OER and especially its impact with students. Um, and so I'm going to be speaking today, you know, from my perspective at OpenCourseWare, recognizing you know that we have a you know our own kind of relationship with the global learning community, and hopefully you'll 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 take some things from from my talk. That are uh, relevant, you know, to your world, and also look forward to a conversation uh, uh, after I get done talking. Um, love to hear your perspective on some of the some of the questions and ideas that I that I hope to be uh, raising. So let me just start by saying here, you know, we're now enter entering our third decade, and reflecting back on the aspirations that people had when OpenCourseWare was first conceived and launched you know, in 2001 on into 2002, I can say without a doubt that it has exceeded everyone's wildest expectations. You know, there was a sense that, yeah, this is a, this is a big thing, you know, it's a kind of an audacious experiment, but an experiment nonetheless. And what it has turned into, you know, not only at MIT, but in particular, the ways that, you know, people from so many different communities and so many different perspectives around the world have taken this sort of basic idea that knowledge should be free and students in particular should have, you know, that access to, to knowledge in a freer way um, has just gone in some fascinating and really exciting ways. And so, you know, it's with, you know, both, you know, great pride and also great humility because of the ways that people have come together to do this work together, uh, you know, that, uh, that OER has become you know, this great thing that it is. Um, you know, and I, uh, speaking with Delmar a little bit, you know, you know, leading up to this keynote, we talked about the, the idea, the concept of scaling OER. And I want to just acknowledge, you know, from the beginning that there are a lot of different ways to think about scale. And yes, one of them might look like, you know, massive global, you know, sort of here's our thing, we're gonna spread it, you know, you know, the way that we do it globally, you know, like um, say certain uh, industrial agriculture practices and those have certain benefits, you know, they've fed, you know, many millions of people around the world who might not have had access to that food, but they also aren't, you know, uh, the be all end all of different ways to approach things. And I might hold that kind of scale up against the sort of, um, more grassroots, organically generated, interconnected scale that we see in a healthy forest and the diversity of, of contributors and the interconnectedness in that ecosystem is a different kind of scale that's also incredibly rich. Um, so I have a personal, you know, adoration for the, the second one, while, you know, also real kind of gratitude for the ability to kind of grow at, at the first one and trying to hold these things in balance is, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about in, in putting this talk together. And, you know, with regard to scaling OER in particular, um, I'll bring three perspectives that I'll be weaving in. You know, who are we scaling up for, in particular learners? What is it 
that we are scaling up. And in particular, I'll be thinking about the, the ways that content has grown and expanded in all of its myriad forms. Um, and also the how of making OER scale in a general sense, in particular, these practices that have you know, like really taken hold over the past decade in particular for capacity building collaboration and foregrounding equity in all that we do. So uh, I will begin with kind of a reflection from my, my seat at OpenCourseWare on what it's meant to scale OER to us. Um, we estimate that we have reached globally over half a billion learners and educators around the world with these openly shared educational resources. MIT OpenCourseWare, you know, at its, at its root is built upon opening the full MIT curriculum. So it's taking materials that were created by faculty in general in the course of teaching their courses. As Delmar said in the intro, we've got over 2,500 courses reflected on the OCW site, spanning the entire curriculum, all MIT departments from the most basic introductory undergrad material up through the most advanced graduate levels, things that, you know, we think only a few handfuls of people in the world around the world might actually get what's going on, but we're sharing that right along with the, the intro undergrad stuff. Faculty participation in this program is voluntary, but we're glad to be able to have provided enough support and encouragement to make it really, really grow to something substantial. And we estimate about 60% of our instructional uh, uh, faculty and lecturers have participated in some way. That rides on the, the great contributions of the OCW team, which I'm thrilled to support, um, that makes a lot of this happen. You know, that we need to make it as easy as possible for MIT faculty and the community to share these materials. And it's through, through the work of my, uh, my colleagues on the team. OCW is also the stuff, the teaching materials, what you'll find on our website and our other channels. So again, it's mostly artifacts from classroom teaching. In general, we're not asking faculty to do anything more than just teach the class as they would do so, and then give us permission to run with scrubbing the rights and maybe a little bit of restructuring and formatting for accessibility and so forth to share it with the world. Beyond faculty materials, we've also been sharing student contributions from day one, you know, we didn't call it, didn't conceive of it as open pedagogy, but especially from a, from a, you know, a school where the student hands-on experience, especially as you get towards the later end, your degrees is so important. That's been a, a very important part of what we share, you know, like student work on their assignments, their projects and so forth is a key part of, uh, uh, of what we've got in open courseware. Increasingly, it's not just the kind of print materials, but video and other media has become increasingly important. When we launched, all the video was on <clears throat> real media. This was many years before YouTube existed. Uh, things are much different now, but that uh, media uh, content has been really, really important. Lastly, um, and this is for about the last eight years or so, not just the what is taught in MIT we're sharing, but also some of the how and why, the perspective that faculty have on their pedagogical decisions and their inspirations. We're trying to share you know, on OCW sites in the form of these instructor insights interviews. So over our 21 years, you know, a number of milestones, starting from that initial launch, you know, you can read in the New York Times, uh, April 4th, 2001, the, the launch announcement. And it's fascinating to, to see the sort of um, uh, prescience, if you will, that like some of the things that people imagined, how many of them have actually come to pass and how well the reporter actually covered that stuff. And lo and behold, a lot of these things came to be. You know, we can imagine 10 years from now, these great repositories of materials produced by many people around the world that students are able to access. Check, we got that. And so on, year after year after year, you know, milestones that have helped create the kind of scale of OER that we've come to know and love. You know, I'll call out the, uh, the launch of the original OCW consortium in 2005 and growing to several hundred institutions around the world contributing and getting on board with this you know, um, jumping ahead to 2020 and, you know, the COVID pandemic and the global scramble to how the heck are we going to transition everything online? 
um, boy, I was really lucky, if you will, <laughs> that we'd made, you know, these practically 20 years of investment to produce and share these things online. Uh, people who were aware but hadn't really, you know, made great use of it suddenly were. And, you know, um, I'm grateful that we we're, we were, among many others, able to support um, students and educators in making that sort of transition. And, you know, over the last year, uh, thrilled attached to our 20th anniversary to have launched a, a new platform and a new collaborations model, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, I mentioned OCW's global reach. Two thirds of our traffic to our website comes from outside North America. Um, and I think we're thrilled and a part of the exceeding wildest expectations is just getting the sense of the global hunger, the curiosity for this free knowledge has been really impressive. Um, along with, you know, reaching 500 million learners around the world, you know, um, we think that that's, you know, over 200 million folks who've come directly to the website. And then that multiplier effect, the rest of that is having these materials in the hands of educators and the way that they use with their students in their classroom is that multiplier effect. And we're, we're cooking along per month at about 2 million, 2 million visits to the website per month. And that growth of video has become really impactful over the last few years. And our YouTube channel is getting about 5 million views in a typical month. That scale, um, you know, I think we're thrilled, blows us away, and, you know, just continues to motivate the work that we're doing. Um, our users are split pretty evenly between people who are institutionally affiliated, students and educators, and people who are just curious, independent learners or continuing ed professionals who are just curious to keep learning. And the fact that we're straddling both of these worlds, um, I think is really sort of central to the work that we have always done at OCW and continue to do. That educator slice of, you know, roughly 5%, maybe a little bit of an undercount because this is, you know, self-reported through surveys and educators are super busy, maybe less likely to fill out those surveys. But anyway, that narrow slice of educators is a huge multiplier effect. Um, but what it takes to, to serve both people who are in an institution and kind of driven by the, the sort of broader initiatives of those institutions versus the independent learners, you know, is a, is a driver for what you'll see when you, when you think more deeply about what we've been doing at OCW. Beyond the website, you know, um, yeah, we started with the website. Um, that YouTube channel, you know, is the largest subscriber base of any .edu, you know, on YouTube. We've got over 4.6 million subscribers, you know, who are checking out, you know, those thousands of videos. And we were very hesitant to publish videos in the early days because it takes a lot of resource. But we just hear from people again and again, especially independent learners and students, um, that videos are one of the most impactful sources of content. Um, the fact that all, of them are, all our material is Creative Commons licensed helps foster adaptations, language translations, uh, conversions to other formats. Thank you, LibreText, for the work you've done with some of our notes going into, um, uh, into your great online textbook formats. Um, pushing our materials out into mirror drives. You know, it's Creative Commons, free to license, free, free to download and redistribute on your local network and your local community. We've got hundreds of these sites around the world for people who don't have necessarily a reliable backbone bandwidth to, to get their students. Um, those instructor insights interviews that I mentioned about sharing, um, uh, you know, the instructor perspectives, you know, we're, we've, uh, been developed in this, you know, additional channel through podcasts. You can check out OER materials while you're commuting or cooking dinner uh, through the podcast and try to make things come to life. And we've gotten great feedback on that. Um, last but not least, the fact that this material is not only freely shared online, but deep indexed for search tools like Google has opened up, you know, things kind of beyond the, the sort of top level course framing, the course description, and we get, you know, almost half of the traffic to the website coming from, from these organic search referrals. And a lot of them are somebody searching for a very specific term and boom, they drop in on a particular lecture video, a particular problem set, a particular lecture note. 
So yeah, the website and the materials we're putting on there are still kind of the core or the heart of it. But having these additional channels has been a, a huge contributor to, you know, building the sort of global impact that we've had. So thinking more specifically about learner impact. What is it that OCW learners tell us they want? I think this is fascinating that across all of these sectors, when we ask people, what brought you to OCW today? And what, what are you trying to do? A form of, I'm basically trying to improve my personal knowledge. I'm curious, I wanna keep up on things, is far and away the top form. And that's also true for educators, that they're coming to MIT OCW to kind of just keep up on the field and you know, feed their curiosity. We, we hear from many, you know, users, they're sharing anecdotes, stories that, that bring things to a, you know, kind of a richer life. You know, we're hearing from, for instance, people who are coming from a disrupted uh, living situation, such as uh, this uh, student Tuba from Pakistan, who wrote us a number of years ago saying basically, due to the armed conflict in her country, she couldn't rely to get to class. So she was studying kind of in parallel on the OCW while she was trying to take classes there and able to keep things moving because she was finding enough, you know, openly shared on OCW to keep up, up, up to speed. You know, on the other hand, we've got a, you know, a very motivated independent learner, kind of a professional transition person, Trent Parker, who decided he wasn't really into chem chemical engineering, wanted to get into software. And in the space of six months, starting with OCW and then grabbing some other things that he got from MOOCs and uh, boot camp uh, kind of hackathon experiences, learned enough skills using open education materials to get a job at Google. Not everybody's gonna move as quick as Trent, but it just shows what can be possible with the, the sort of broad access to these open education materials. You know, when I think <clears throat> more fundamentally, you know, to, uh, to what people are looking for and what we're offering, you know, these three points around access to knowledge are foundational, foundational, that we want people to have access, open access to knowledge, regardless of their circumstance. We want it to be there with resilience through the kind of disruptions that people are facing. Sometimes they're very personal disruptions. Sometimes they are bigger, broader, more societal. But having stuff freely available online is a really key tool. And definitely not least, and I think particularly pertinent, you know, to the work that, for instance, you're doing in California and in so many schools, having this material be free or minimal cost is truly life changing for people. You know, it's we can't take it for granted how important that is, you know, for people having access to the knowledge that they need. That access is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And so we're continuing to think at OCW about what other things need to be layered on beyond just basically giving access. And so thinking about like, what else does it take for people to feel empowered with that knowledge? You know, the fact that the material is, is available to them in a self-paced way means that regardless of how complicated your life is, you know, it works for you and you're in sufficient control so that you can make use of it in a way that works for you in your life as much or as little as you need. And especially in these last few years, thinking very intentionally about what it takes to make, say, the starting materials that you might have used in a particular setting more inclusive, more culturally relevant, the ways that we work together to adapt these materials and understand from each other what it takes has become really, really key to um, expanding that learner impact. At MIT, OpenCourseWare, we're thinking, for instance, about you know how do we share the ways that gender equity is woven into the curriculum? For instance, a course uh, taught on the history of women in science and engineering is awesome in its own right, and doubly so because one of the assignments is you know brings in some great open pedagogy practices. Uh, a Wikipedia assignment that asks students to go out on Wikipedia and find examples of places where, where something is underrepresented or needs some attention, write that article and put it out there. And that, you know, 
we're always on the hunt at MIT for ways to share things that are happening within our curriculum and hopefully are inspiring to others, you know, ways to, um, ways to boost equity through, uh, through an OER lens. We're also um, in some ways maybe returning back to um, efforts to um, start starting from the fact that, you know, this is basically MIT material that we're dealing with. What other sorts of inspirations, pre-college inspirations, supports and scaffolding might we have? Um, a bunch of years ago, we launched a program called Highlights for High School, um, which was largely framed about around helping people um, study for the AP exams by extracting things from introductory OCW materials. Um, that became such a kind of shifting target uh, that we weren't able to kind of keep up with the investment needed to keep it up to date so that that content was retired. But the need is still there for people who are heading college and especially heading college and don't necessarily have all of the say most privileged preparation that we can provide for them. So we're, um, we're trying to identify and share um, resources that can be useful in this kind of pre-college inspiration and scaffolding. So, you know, courses that, for instance, uh, girls who build cameras, you know, these very hands-on experiences where we can share materials that educators around the world might be able to use in their own settings. Um, a, a program called MITES, which um, provides kind of semester long and summer long um, uh, in-person and virtual experiences. Uh, you know, it's STEM focused, but it's also for people who, you know, you know, could use a leg up and getting really ready for college. Those materials are both kind of STEM rigorous, but also have really interesting layers running through them uh, to make them more inclusive for folks. Uh, and this last item, getting up to speed in biology. This is like, um, you know, for people who are going to take our freshman biology class at MIT, um, just kind of helping people scaffold up you know, dependent regardless of their preparation. And we think those kind of materials, you know, are really useful. We're finding them really useful, you know, to, um, to make the OER that we started with publishing, our introductory biology classes, more inclusive, more readily accessible for people. And uh, if you're able to check some of those out, we hope you might find them also that way. Um, closing, you know, beyond that, just improving personal knowledge, what else do OCW users want? This starts to segment a little bit by the type of user they are. Educators, that multiplier effect is, is really key, you know, and they specifically are telling us in, you know, substantial numbers that, you know, you are looking for OER that you can incorporate into a course directly and also from which to derive other inspirations and learn new teaching methods. Um, students, are primarily telling us that they're looking to OCW, you know, to complement their current course of studies with supplemental materials, looking for alternative explanations, additional problems for study, you know, but we do have this interesting kind of direct relationship with students. And independent learners, you know, most of them, if beyond just general curiosity, they've got something in mind, they're preparing for some future work or future studies. They're also telling us, that boy, what they'd really like is to maybe be able to get a credential for this thing and have some interaction with students. And uh, it was starting to drive us nuts <laughs> around 2010, 11, 12, trying to support the, uh, the growing need that students had there. Thank God MOOCs were created and you know built purpose built for these full course experiences and credential granting things. It's, uh, it's allowed us to sort of return our focus more, uh, more directly on the sort of course materials. Uh, but we have this kind of complementary relationship where maybe we're providing some prereq uh, preparations or complementary things for people who are in a more of a MOOC study mode uh, and thrilled that, that independent learners increasingly have those other ways to learn as well. Um, turning our attention to content a little bit, um, I reflect on three aspects. Um, having relevant topics for the learners of today in formats that work, and meeting learners in particular where they are. And they're coming from a lot of different places. <clears throat> OCW's 10 most popular courses, no surprise, come from the STEM fields and they're dominated by computer science, math, and physics. Um, you know, and these are, these have been pretty much our 10 most popular courses from the first day we published them. 
this doesn't really shift much. You know, occasionally there's something that goes viral, but this is pretty much it. I want to learn how to program. I'm looking for some help or a leg up on some like first year math and physics stuff. And then we're off. But we're really clear also that, you know, this is not just a popularity contest. And that breadth of coverage across these 2,500 courses, we hear from people again and again and again, the courses that, that aren't the most popular for them as individuals are truly life-changing. So, so, you know, and each one of these has been raised to us by, in, in most cases, multiple people who have told us there was something about one of these courses, a course specifically a deep dive on the human brain, uh, film studies class, uh, ways of thinking about um, sustainable development, appropriate development in developing countries, ways to create video games that are engaging and learning the um, kind of team process for doing this kind of collaborative work. Super advanced graduate level physics classes that changed the life of a couple of people. You know, they pivoted in what they're studying in undergrad. Um, a, uh, an artist who's, uh, whose work dried up in COVID, decided he wanted to make a career change, discovered a whole new, uh, whole new career that he's bringing his creativity to having to do with um, uh, finance. And this finance theory class uh, rocked his world. You know, these are not are among our 10 most popular courses, uh, but the breadth of interest that we're seeing from people helps us stay kind of committed to the, uh, the full representation of the MIT curriculum that we can do. Um, I've talked about these other channels and the growth of video. Um, a few years ago, we surveyed our users for what are the most desired forms of content for you? And we asked them, you know, once we understand what type of user that they were. And so these are the, um, these are the five most popular types of content in aggregate. And that video and audio lectures, well, let's call it, it's video basically, were the most popular across the board. And especially, not just for independent learners, but that enrolled students, you know, really, really keyed on those video, those video lectures. I think there's something about alternative explanations from a trusted source that's, uh, that's really clicking here. And that's motivating us to invest as much as we possibly can in building out more video. You know, um, I think of lecture notes and slides and full on full text readings, including online textbooks is kind of all, you know, all part of the same collection. You know, um, we've got a lot of lecture notes on OCW that are really rich and readable, and we wouldn't have ourselves off the bat called them online textbooks, but they can kind of function that way. And, and you know, we're you know increasingly moving some of those notes in the direction of calling them online textbooks when they really feel like they're readable. Um, you know, and it's noteworthy for educators that really good lecture notes and video lectures are right up there, almost neck and neck. Um, and then, you know, that having assignments and exam problems and having solutions to those problems are also pretty much lined up. Part of the voluntary contribution uh, uh, for our for instructors putting things on OCW that we, you know, we continue to wrestle with is they understandably don't always want to share the solutions to their work. And especially good exam problems are really hard to make. We always encourage, we try to work with folks to come up with some creative solutions to give people some way to check their work, but it's not always there. You know, a little less than half of our problem set content on OCW has some sort of uh, solution content, but those, you know, stand up, you know, not surprisingly as, is also really important. Um, so, you know, Overall, this you know really lights a fire under us to keep pushing video in particular and the richest notes we possibly can. The fact that video is a gateway um, uh, really stands out. Um, and for many learners, I think they they discover open education through video, through YouTube. You know, um, we know that one of the most popular things that drives people into YouTube is how do I and then fill in the blank sort of a general learning framework. So every one of the videos that we publish on OCW has a link to the underlying um, uh, course materials. And YouTube is a substantial referrer back to our website. And probably, I'm guessing maybe about 10% of the YouTube views 
lead follow through to some sort of, you know, checking out of the materials on the website. A lot of people are just happy to check out those videos and move on. And we're, and we're thrilled to have that. <clears throat> Another part of, you know, meeting learners where they are is the ways that systems like YouTube have these recommendation algorithms. There's a one hour um, seminar that uh, the late Patrick Winston, a, a, a computer science artificial intelligence professor at MIT, you know, gave in January for something like 40 years. And we were thrilled to get one of the last times he gave that talk, shared that on a video. And for some reason, this thing has just caught hold, gone viral in the YouTube recommendation algorithm in the space of about three years, grabbed about 15 million views. And it's an hour long video. There's this thing, this belief that, ah, nobody watches long videos on OCW. Um, but, you know, like half of the views get halfway through this video. You know, it's a, you know, it's, it's the exclusion to the rule that only short videos work, that people are really checking out uh, more intensive content on YouTube. Uh, beyond videos, number two on that most important format. Yeah, you know, online textbooks are really key. And it feels to us, and we, you know, we recognize that more broadly in the open education ecosystem, we are in the era of open textbooks. And there's something really just essential to the, the classroom and learner educator experience that textbooks are, are performing. And we're glad that, you know, really high quality published lecture notes can serve in this form. You know, um, depending on how you slice it, we've got, you know, 40, 50, maybe 100, you know, um, sets of notes on OCW that kind of form like this, serve like this. And uh, we'll turn a little bit more back to this, uh, talk about how, uh, Thrilled we are that LibreText has pulled some of these as well. Um, oh, it's right here. <laughs> yeah. Um, for instance, a, uh, a set of notes for our, our, our physics one, classical mechanics, um, that were, you know, kind of released, you know, conceptually. It was a really rich set of notes. You know, sometimes we think of it as an online textbook. And, uh, you know, Delmar and his team, you know, identified these and converted them, you know, not only into a really nice, um, sort of a modularized HTML format that's really easy to browse and work through, but also has these great export formats. For instance, uh, I believe there's an export into Canvas and the ability to print a nice, uh, you know, paper format out of this. And so just serves to expand the reach and hopefully, you know, through these sort of adaptations enabled by the Creative Commons license, um, you know, get these materials in the hands of even more people. So with with great appreciation for that sort of adaptation. Um, part of our new platform, which I said, uh, you know, released last year, is making it mobile responsive. Um, this uh, was a few years in making. We would have liked to have it sooner, but we've, I know, we're gradually growing the fact that people are coming straight to OCW on their phones. About uh, a little over a third of our traffic at this point is, is coming from people on phones. Um, my apologies to them if they're trying to read through a set of very mathy lecture notes on their phone. Bless them. Uh, send it to your desktop and you'll have an easier time of it, but we're making the best of it we can. But that, that mobile use is growing. And you know, part of the broader access to equity um, momentum that we're trying to build is recognizing that globally, especially, there's a lot of people for whom their mobile device is their only reliable device. And so getting the materials to work as well as we can make it on mobile is a, is a key part of meeting learners wherever we are, wherever they are. <clears throat> um, you know, I mentioned that, uh, that Google uh, search deep linking is a key part of meeting people. You know, here's an example of, of a search string that I know somebody had put in that led them to to our um, to a particular lecture note, and so um, I, while the uh, you know a lot of other forms of online learning like MOOCs don't necessarily allow this kind of deep linking, if we can put things like our online textbooks and our OER up and search indexable in this deep form, it's really going to help. Um, you know, beyond search. Um, thinking about ways to um, to get the materials out again on these other channels for social and referral. Uh, 
uh, you know, um, uh, Reddit is in there and some of the other sort of repositories <coughs> providing these referrals. Um, also really important traffic sources and things that we put attention on. Uh, but it's, you know, it's hard to beat just, again, meeting people where they are, they're, they're searching for a thing they want to learn about. And uh, it's, it's just meeting people's curiosity. On the practices front, I um, want to reflect on capacity building, the interplay with collaboration, especially in the form of equity, and a little reflection on pruning and composting. Um, in our experience, that capacity building really starts with faculty, with the teaching staff, and, and what it takes to support them. You know, I mentioned uh, OCW at MIT, faculty participation is voluntary. And uh, we would not be where we are if we weren't able to provide the kind of resources that faculty just say, here's my stuff, go with it. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, I know there are other models, you know, in other institutions. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's really important to be able to develop that sort of support services model in ways that that work for you all. You know, um, we're re been really intrigued to watch the growth of, you know, Kind of targeted, say, online textbook grant funded models to develop in a collaborative way, in particular, um, OER uh, to, to meet a particular need. And so um, those support services, especially to the extent they can come with a little financial support, maybe even a recognition that, you know, um, I might need a little, little uh, slack time in my workload. Um, the amount of classes that I'm teaching or to provide, you know, instructional design and librarian support uh, is really key. Um, also, I think part of building that capacity with faculty is the ability to, to engage in, well, sometimes it's a, it's a long-term conversation about what are the benefits to this open sharing? And those benefits may take different forms depending on what the faculty's interests are. I've had a number of cases in my time at OCW where, you know, five years or more, you know, from the starting conversation to somebody saying, you know, I remember talking about this, you know what, I'm ready. Um, it happens. And so making those investments in like planting the seeds and why, why might you want to share, you know, uh, fundamentally, you know, it's hard to think of a better way to build the impact of the work that they're most passionately connected to, build their reputation, help them make connection with peers and colleagues around the world. You know, some examples of things, you know, the kinds of things that I've had, I and, and our team have had to, uh, to play out with, uh, with MIT faculty, you know, when we're voluntarily approaching them, the timing's not right, too busy, but maybe later, you know, okay, that's great. While we've got you, anything that you can share with us about uh, what you're what you're thinking about your materials, you know, the sense that oh, this stuff's got to be really stable before I can share it. You know, um, I need to put my best foot forward, having some sort of plan in place and building trust that that they'll be able to update the materials in a in a nim sufficiently nimble fashion has been really key. Um, sometimes, you know. More so in the early days, less so you know, over time, there might be questions about what exactly it means from a rights perspective to share my stuff online. Um, the license that we ask MIT or the faculty to sign tells them that they retain, retain fundamentally the copyright to the work. They are only granting us a license, non-exclusive, but only granting us a license to share the materials in the forms that we do. And fundamentally, the material is theirs and they can do other stuff with it. They can find a way to produce a textbook that's not on OCW. Bless them. We're here to help them if they want. And if they even want to sell it, you know, <laughs> you know, best wishes. Uh, we will support you and you're allowed to do that as well. And that does still happen sometimes. Um, another one that's really, you know, important for many people at MIT, especially when you get into the upper level classes, where it's very project focused or it's very discussion oriented, very seminary is like, yeah, my teaching methods don't really work online. You know, um, uh, is too much discussion. You know, the students have too big of a hand in it. And I don't want the fact that we might be sharing the materials, you know, 
what they're contributing online to chill their experience in their education in any way. We get that. We absolutely get that. So anytime when we're uh, entering into a conversation with faculty, with a course where the students in particular have a, have a strong hand in what's produced, we're right there from the beginning, you know, saying, you know, do not let what we're talking about here in any way chill your full-throated engagement in the learning experience. Have no fear that what you're doing, you know, we want you to show up for the class experience without fear that it might come back to, to bite you, you know, five years down the road when you're looking for a job. At any time we're sharing student work on our site, you know, we we go through a process to make sure they understand that number one, it can be shared anonymous, anonymously. We encourage them to share it anonymously. If they really want to, we're happy to put their name on it, but know that once it's put online, you can't fully scrub it. And uh, in general, you know, people are able to make that decision. A lot of what we share from students at this point is anonymous. Occasionally people are like super proud. They know what they're doing and they have no fear. And we're happy to put their name on it. And that's all great. Um, one last thing, you know, I, I did mention about not sharing the, uh, the solutions in many cases. Yeah, you know, we get that. You know, sometimes we'll say, um, yeah, if we're sharing the problem sets from, you know, the course we taught this year, is there something from five years ago, just as an example that we can share? Or maybe there's a study guide, you know, yeah, it's not the assignments, but it's a it's an example of the kind of back and forth interaction that we can we can come up with. By by all means, we don't want to encourage cheating, but is there some way that we can provide something that still serves in, in terms of completeness? So those are you know a few examples of the kinds of things that we we get into in, in working with faculty to try to build their support. Um, so collaborations and equity, you know. I don't think any of us would be where we are in this work if it wasn't for the, the infrastructure that's built and the way that we're able to show up increasingly in collaborative spaces like this one and like in the, the growing evolving consortiums and conferences that have been built. Um, so just, you know, just the greatest appreciation for people's ability to recognize and step in and lend their voices to what we've been building together through this process. Um, Particularly of interest at MIT Open Courseware, you know, over the last couple of years, and we're investing increasingly uh, our work. And my my colleague uh, Shira Siegel, sorry, I'm going to call you out. Uh, our our recently uh, on board uh, collaborations and engagement manager, who's uh, helping us with this work. Um, we recognize that it takes you know real investment to build you know collaborations across different institutions across different. Um, sort of context. So we recognize that what we've shared on OCW coming from that classroom, it was built for MIT students in the MIT classroom. And that's not the same as a lot of other educational situations. You know, A lot of this stuff is quote, MIT hard, certain prerequisite skills and knowledge. You know, regretfully, um, we don't really have any physics that's not starting from calculus. And we know that a lot of people are in different places. So maybe there are other sorts of scaffolds and preparations and adaptations that could use some of what we shared on OCW as inspirations, or you're, here's where you're, here's where you might be heading, but can wrap other things around it. So investing with other educators, you know, to explore ways that some of the things that we've been sharing on OCW might be relevant in your context. You know, so, and what forms those might take. Maybe there's ways that we can, for instance, stack some um, some videos we've got in OCW with open textbooks that you all have created, which are so wonderfully saving millions of dollars in students' pocketbooks. Um, um, maybe there's ways that some of the uh, materials that students have created can be inspirations for other students. We can find ways to, um, to create some sort of shared repository of great things that students are doing together uh, to, um, to personalize, make more culturally relevant their learning and have that stood up alongside the faculty created materials. Um, you know, I just, you know, wanna also say that, you know, this work 
while it's freely shared, ain't free, as we all know. And, you know, we're always on the hunt for ways to, to bring better resources to bear, whether that's grant funding, um, ways to support the, the tremendous staff that provides you know, support for the creation and sharing of OER, such as, such as librarians, and uh, the great work that some of our, our colleagues are doing to build support for government policies, you know. Thrilled to see what's been happening in California around some policy supports, the textbook grants, other work that folks like Creative Commons and Spark is doing uh, is trying to make it just easy for us to, to create these spaces to collaborate together. Um, close, uh, close this out with two specific collaborations I just wanted to mention that we're really excited about. Um, over the last, uh, I'd say, 18 months, we've been in a collaboration with a growing network of HBCUs who are developing their own OER practices, starting from what they work in. Uh, there are, by some counts, about 30 schools that are developing these practices. And a lot of that, you know, first year plus has been like building relationships, you know, because the context in which, in which people are working, kind of building understanding and trust has been uh, really, really central um, to being able to work together. Um, and we've, you know, now been moving in the direction of uh, some uh, webinars, which uh, I think, you know, we'll be doing some things that might be open to the uh, open to the public in the, in the year to come about things like culturally relevant education uh, and how we've learned together what some of these things mean. Um, we're also thrilled to be able to, you know, associate with this process, the collaboration with HBCUs have shared a set of resources we've curated that um, we've understood might be relevant to the, uh, um, what, what's known as the Affordable Learning Solutions Cultural Collections that uh, the Merlot Repository, um, yay Merlot, uh, has, uh, has produced. I'm glad to have that in there. And with regard to that, it takes support. You know, this was made possible. Thank you to the, uh, to the Hewlett Foundation, uh, allowed us to come together and work together in, uh, with support in ways that would not have otherwise been possible. You know, another collaboration that's more recent, just getting off the ground, one that's focused on community colleges. And um, this, you know, we're thrilled to be able to uh, begin work on a pilot this coming academic year with College of the Canyons, along with Maricopa Community Colleges in Arizona, um, to work with them on curating some materials based on stated faculty interests from their schools. Uh, uh, the hope that not only these things will be used in some teaching this coming year, but also any adaptations and maybe ancillary material that's been shared back uh, will be will be put in a place where other people can not only see but build upon. Um, our um, that instructor insights podcast, instructor interviews process we've been developing will be brought to bear here in uh, documenting and sharing some case studies with the participants in this program. And uh, really looking forward to the results of that. And uh, thank you to the Sloan Foundation for providing that support to help make this possible. And again, provide the resources and the backing, you know, that uh, that's needed to allow uh, allow our participants uh, in this program. Uh, lastly, in terms of practices, um, we've uh, we've been reflecting on uh, all the things that we've accumulated over the last 21 years and uh, recognizing, yeah, boy, there's a lot of great stuff we've done that really excited about. You know, I don't wanna make it sound like everything we do works. <laughs> you know, I know, top of mind has been for the kind of asynchronous learning mode that OCW tends to work in. We still haven't figured out a way to produce a, a practical functional study group experience for people. We've made a couple of runs at this over the years. And it's, it's really sad that, you know, somebody will post in a topic group or a group associated with a class, a really interesting, insightful question. But I think because the mode of engagement is so asynchronous, there's nobody there. Um, and we'd love to figure out some way to solve this. Um, if you have any bright ideas, if you've seen anything that seems to work more effectively, you know, I'm, uh, I'm curious if there might be something in some of the, uh, the annotation tools um, that we might start to play with here is one of the things on my mind personally. Uh, I look forward to a round three that might work better. Other things that we've had in our program, practices that worked for a while, 
that stopped working and we've sort of pulled down. Um, you know, for a number of years, we had official translation partners and people did, you know, targeted, curated human translations for a bunch of years. And we had over a thousand OCW courses translated into to 10 plus languages. Um, took a lot of resources. And over time, each one of those programs kind of dwindled and um, fell out of date. And at this point, none of them are active. It's, uh, it's sad to see. But to the rescue, we believe, and I'll close on this a little bit, automated translations hold some promise. I mentioned highlights for high school, no longer working, not so happening. Lastly, I'll say um, over 21 years, we still have some courses that were published in those first couple of years that are still in OCW. Um, while some of the methodology may have changed, the, the fundamental content for like first year calculus, first year physics, uh, hasn't really changed that much. And so some of these things continue to be up. They might be 20 years old, but we think of this, them as venerable classics. On the other hand, there are some things that uh, probably aren't so relevant. We've been engaged uh, in a uh, um, uh, an intentional process with departments to identify things that maybe are no longer so up to date. And so, in that spirit of, you know, keeping things vibrant and current, you know, um, uh, you may see some things disappearing off the OCW site into our archive. Um, so this is part of uh, part of what we've come to see as an important practice for keeping our site up to date. So what's next? A um, couple things on my mind. Um, one of them, again, I mentioned this like automated uh, machine driven, uh, uh, you know, language translation stuff. And I'm gonna quit screen sharing here to show something we're really just intrigued and excited about. Uh, we've been able to be a participant in a pilot program from, um, this comes out of like Google's experimental lab. It's called Google Aloud, and they've integrated this now into YouTube. And I can just show you a demo here. We've just started rolling this out incrementally. They don't have a ton of capacity, so we can't retrofit a lot of our collection yet. But they have released the ability to automated voice dub into several different languages um, based on the transcript. And so uh, a recent course we've published on the urban energy systems and policy has this across all of its languages, across all of its videos, auto dubbed into Spanish and Portuguese. And oops, I shared the wrong thing. I can't talk and pay attention very well at the same time. Here we go. So here's a quick demo. So this I is- I tell you, it's about Professor Robert Bullard. This is- One of the leading scholars on environmental racism and environmental justice. And I think it's just a good story of how he gets- Este tema y cómo sigue escribiendo sobre estos asuntos hoy en día. Here's the Spanish dubbed version. Hay un retrato de 2012 a la izquierda. Este es un pequeño extracto a la derecha. Es una lista de resumen de disputas comunitarias de uno de sus primeros escritos sobre el racismo ambiental. Y, esencialmente, enumera los movimientos de base en todo el sur, pero también en el oeste. So, you, you noticed, um, for instance, there's, there's, uh, there's gaps in the timeline, in the audio. You know, you know, one of the things that they're working on is... Uh, when you do a translation from one language to another, sometimes it takes more or fewer words to get it across. Um, what we've heard is they're you know, continually gonna try to improve to make, make it feel more natural in, in each language. We look forward to the day when Patrick Winston's How to Speak video, which is rich in vernacular, um, can be auto-translated and work in many different languages. That's, when that works, we'll know we've, uh, we've gotten somewhere. So, so that's one thing we're really, uh, really excited about. You know, in a similar vein, we're really, you know, flat, uh, glad that um, LibreText, you know, again, you know, not only has converted some of our notes into online textbooks, but has started experimenting with uh, automated language translations. And uh, we're also internally taking a look at this. Um, but, you know, Delmar, I've appreciated how you've been spreading the word about this. We're just really intrigued uh, in the ability of machine translations 
you know, to be able to solve the scaling problem, which ran aground, you know, a bunch of years ago and trying to do this at human scale, you know, and is 95% accuracy good enough? You know, 98, how do we get there? These are the sort of questions that I'm really eager to get to work collectively on. How do we determine? How do we, how do we provide the right sort of say peer review and say, yeah, this one's ready to go. Um, be a really interesting, I think really important project to get to uh, work collectively on. Um, another form of uh, what's next for us is bringing increasing attention on impact topics, you know, and thinking about say the, the outsized resources that a school like MIT has to, to bring to um, topics that need extra attention. I can't think of a more worthy topic than climate change. Um, and this is among the topics that I'm personally very invested in. Uh, and I'm looking forward to leading a workshop session if any of you are making it to OE Global in October about how to build an open knowledge community of practice around climate. Um, I know there's you know, other things that have been taking shape here. OER Commons, you know, ISKME has created a, 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 a climate education hub and um, look forward to folks, you know, again, working collectively together in a collaborative way, you know, um, it is clear that we need, you know, <laughs> everything working as quickly and as adaptively and, and as inclusively as possible around ways to bring, you know, open knowledge to bear on problems like this. Um, last, what's next? I couldn't help it. Generative AI, it's definitely something that's next. I don't know what's happening. Something will definitely be happening. I'd be curious to uh, hear what might be in your minds around generative AI. A few things which I wouldn't dare put on a slide right now, but I'll just say off the cuff. Um, you know, there's there's concerns about the trustworthiness of what AI is being trained upon. And perhaps open education resources are a relatively more trusted corpus of material. And maybe we can encourage some good AI chatbots and tools to train themselves on what we've got. And perhaps, you know, AI, generative AI um, interaction methodologies might, might become a, a more effective um, content discovery tool than the search that we've known, you know, and, you know, to have, you know, your, uh, your friendly buddy, you know, uh, AI professor who's always got office hours they can use as a front end to help um, help you discover materials as a starting point and point you in the right direction. There are a couple of things that I personally am curious about how AI might affect what we're doing at OER. So with that, um, I'll just say, here's to way more, you know, uh, many more years of exceeding our wild expectations together, and doing this collaboratively. I look forward to, uh, to what the future holds for us and uh, the opportunity to talk. I think we're up at an hour here. Um, thank you for the opportunity um, and look forward to hearing what people might be, might have in your minds.